Okay, great job, Scott, again. We will now move on to the second and one of my favorite parts of the meeting, table topics, which is led by Tricia today. I'll now hand the stage off to Tricia. Thank you, Slate, and thank you everyone for being a part of our meeting today. So now we are transitioning into the second portion of our meeting, table topics, like previously mentioned. It's our impromptu section of the meeting. It's an opportunity for everyone uh, to, you know, take their, their hand at taking the virtual stage, uh, virtual stage, getting comfortable and speaking a group of people. And so the theme of today's meeting, well, I wouldn't say there's a theme necessarily to the questions asked, but rather the method I'm using to ask them. So when I joined Toastmasters my freshman year, like my mom would always ask questions and check in on how I'm doing and all of that. And I found out that she like ordered this huge stack of table topics cards. Now we've never had the opportunity to use them. I don't know if they're officially Toastmasters backed, but on the bottom it says table topics original. So I was like, you know what? This is a perfect opportunity. I know a great group of people could be down to answer some questions. So that's what we've got for our theme today. With each table topics question, you have one to two minutes to respond. We encourage that you reach your minimum one minute. Um, and then from there, you can decide to continue to move on to end your speech then. Um, beyond two minutes, you do have a 30 second grace period, um, which at that point, you would not qualify for votes afterwards. And Kaylee will be doing a great job keeping us and all of our table topic speakers in time. So uh, that's about it for table topics in terms of how we run. Oh, I know I missed one thing. I apologize. So we, there is, this is like brief side note, but there is like a regional table topics question. So I wanted to give y'all an insight and in what a table topics contest would look like with other clubs. So typically we wouldn't know the question until you get up to the stage, but I'm gonna go easy on y'all and say the question first in advance. And hopefully one of y'all volunteer, if no one volunteers, I will have to call on someone. And whoever volunteers or gets called in at that point, I will repeat the question one more time for you. And then you can go ahead and begin responding to your question. All right, with that, I will go ahead and randomly choose a card with our first one being, what is your proudest accomplishment? It can be academic related, personally, in a relationship, something silly, something very monumentous in your life. What is your proudest accomplishment? I can do this one. All right, go ahead, Justin, you got it. And the question again, what is your proudest accomplishment? So it was 2016 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I was being told that I had to use power tools to build a gigantic toolbox out of wood. This was a nightmare to me at the time. I had to use a nail gun. I had to use an electric saw. I had to use all this kind of stuff. And it was pretty terrifying. And somehow I made it through without shooting myself or cutting my fingers off. And that was pretty awesome. And it was, it was really a demonstrable representation of, of, of my progress. Like just being able to see the box and hold it was really, I don't know, it increased my confidence, caught my confidence a lot. I would say another accomplishment I wrote for the first time last semester, a 13 page research paper and I've never done that before it's probably the longest paper I've ever written and I think that's an anomaly because most people I talk to seem to have written a lot longer papers than that but it was so cool and it was a class that we could choose our own projects just as long as it fit in a certain category and I learned a lot through it so it was it was pretty awesome so thank you so much and back to you Thank you, Justin. Yeah, I mean, definitely the, the feeling of building something from scratch. Now, personally, I haven't built something, but anything like cooking or baking, it, 
it feels different. And dang, that's that's a pretty long paper from my perspective as well. I think I've had to do a similar late, similarly linked paper, but it was with a group, so it wasn't as as tedious. So kudos to you. All right, we've got our next table topics question. What is your dream job? You can take it from the perspective of when you were little or what's your current dream job? I'd love to do this one if that's okay. Yeah, you got it, Corson. And your question again, uh, what is your dream job? Um, all right, so my name's Corson Eels. Um, this is my first Toastmasters meeting. Um, so I'm really happy to have met y'all and I look forward to more of them. Whenever I was a kid, um, I remember in middle school doing a little future career, um, I guess, survey. And I'd really wanted to work for Apple back then because I was um, absolutely fascinated with technology. And uh, now sort of as I've gotten older, still very interested in technology and something in the technology world would be interesting. Um, but now my dream job would be to go into the cannabis industry. Um, it's an ever-growing market, and it's something that uh, can, in my belief, can definitely help sort of uh, this country in a lot of ways, from the the opioid epidemic to um, to alcoholism to our addiction to tobacco um, and nicotine, um, as well as just helping people that have chronic pain and stuff like that. It's a uh, something that I believe um, in a lot and it would be an absolute dream to go into the cannabis industry. So that's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you, Corson. Man, I, I love that response and really just hearing people speak about their passions, you know, cause I feel like you can get an, an even greater insight into a person just, just listening, talk to their, their passion about. So thank you and look yeah, forward, yeah. you know, maybe that could be an inspiration for a speech idea in the future. You never know. It probably will. <laughs> All right, we've got our next table topics question. Random card, random card. What makes a house a home? It can be something, inspiration from your own home, something you've seen in a TV show, movie, book. I can take this one. All right, Zarin, you've got it. What makes a house a home? So what makes a house a home? So I think I'm going to go with the more nuanced and like traditional answer and say the people inside the home, like the family itself, makes a house turn into a home. So speaking out of like my own personal experience, I don't think I've necessarily had a true home. So throughout my childhood, I've had to like move several times. I was born in Cleveland, grew up in Illinois. Now I live in Georgia. So I've been like multiple places. I never really had a place where I really grew up and can call my hometown. So whenever someone asks me where I'm from, I don't know what to say, where I was born, where I was raised when I was like a little kid, where I'm currently living. Like we have these type of identities. We often tie our identities to these locations, right? Either to cities, addresses or something like that. But we have to realize these addresses are all, they're not permanent. They're all temporary. Maybe tomorrow you're going to move to a different state. Maybe the next day you're going to move to a different country. It doesn't matter. What matters in the end is who we are and what we feel is like more comfortable. Like for me right now, even though I'm actually in my home, oftentimes I find Athens and UGA to be like a second home to me. So I feel that it's just whatever we find like the closest emotional connection to or the place that we feel like accepted and something along those lines is what we can really call our home. Thank you, Trisha. Thank you, Soren. And I love that perspective. You know, it's kind of similar to the question, like when you when you first meet someone, you say, oh, like, what do you do? Like a person is more than what they do, just as what you've pointed out in your speech, a house is more than just an address. So thank you. Okay. All right, we've got next table topics. Boom. If you could have a front row, if you could have, if you could have front row seats to any concert, who would you like to see and why? Got any music buffs out there? <laughs> Can be uh, someone you admired when you were younger, or perhaps your music tastes have changed. Yes, Scott. Scott. All right. Yeah, if, if you could have any front row seats to any concert, who would you like to see? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, oh, okay. Well, uh, well 
if I if I had to pick so um, if I had to pick someone that I would want for front row seats to, uh, well, if he was if he if he was to if he, if he was still pl uh, playing playing these days, I would I would lo love the opportunity to see either Pete uh, Pete Townsend Pete Townsend or Roger Daltrey pr um, uh, for, from the Who pr pr uh, performing live. I pick, I pick those two too because out of all the groups of, of the, in my opinion, the best era for pop music, the 60s and the 70s, which also the best era for rock music, being able to sit, uh, to see either of those two, uh, two men who can st still miraculously pl uh, play instruments as, a, as, if, as, if, it's, as if it's in, in endemic in their, in, uh, in, their, in, their, in their very nature. Be, uh, being uh, being able even to see Pete uh, Pete Townsend play his guitar, play his guitar, or even R Roger D Daltrey still to this day, be, um, be belt out those vo uh, vocals at his at his current age, I would love an opportunity to see either of those two uh, two men in co concert, and hopefully I'll have that opportunity before before either one of them des decides to retire from music. So thanks, guys. Thank you for that, Scott. And nice job sneaking that word, uh, the word of the day in um, kind of brief intro. I'm not sure, I don't remember if we introduced it, but we do have a word of the day. And so anytime someone in the audience uses it, you know, you know like, like you just saw, uh, we have a bunch of reactions. So our word of the day is endemic, which is an adjective meaning to occur normally where found. So great job including that. And yeah, I'm looking to expand my music taste as well. I have a professor, his bonus questions are about 80s rocks. So I've just been going through Spotify and just playing random songs, hopefully, to expand horizons that way. So great job again, Scott. All right, for our next table topics question. What do you dream your life will be like in 10 years? Or you could take this from the perspective of 10 years ago. Uh, what, was, what was your dream for your life 10 years ago and how does it compare to your life now? I can try this one. All right, go ahead, Courtney. In 10 years, I hope that I work at a university and I have classes of students that I'm teaching some type of ecology or class focused on degradation to the natural environment. I hope that I'm also doing amazing research in which I study ways in which we can all uh, reduce our footprint, especially related to something I've just always been kind of obsessed with since I was a kid is just our overuse of products and a lot of ways in which our society is just not set up in the right ways. And it encourages an incredibly just excessive way of living. And so I hope that I can really make an impact in that field. And I hope that I'm a important person who, who really creates change. And I hope to be able to travel and talk about it. Um, using the skills that I've learned right here in Toastmasters and, and just be impactful in, in the things that I do and, and just feel fulfilled in the career that I, path that I've chosen. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Courtney. Awesome response, you know, combining your skills, your passions and, and moving toward it. And just from based from what I've heard in, in previous meetings and your background and, and really in the science, I think you're on, on a good path towards that dream. All right, we've got our next table topics question. Would you rather visit a big city or the countryside? If it could be, all right, go ahead, Freshia. So would you rather to visit a big city or the countryside? So I love Athens and I love how um, small the community is. However, I very much consider myself a city slicker among these country folk. And so I would very much rather visit the big city. And I love touring places like New York 
and Los Angeles. And I am from the metro Atlanta area. So I grew up visiting Midtown and downtown Atlanta a lot. And this is also because big cities usually have huge landmarks and also huge historical sites. I love to go visit museums, I love to go visit art galleries, and I also love to explore mm -hmm. new cuisines and new restaurants. And more often than not, big cities will usually have more cuisines, more cultures that I can explore. And you can also meet mm -hmm. new people in the city. And that is why I prefer visiting the big city over a small, a smaller countryside. Awesome. Thank you, Preciosa. Yeah, I feel like Athens has a little bit of all of that, but it's probably unique in that, you know, we're a college town, so just naturally you will have a mix of cultures and everything. But yeah, I can definitely see, uh, like, uh, coming from uh, Metro Atlanta myself, just kind of getting lost in, in exploring what a city you would have to offer. So awesome job. All right, we've got our next table topic. If you could be brilliant in one subject, in one subject, which would you choose? You can take inspiration from your classes or from a, a video, video you saw, maybe a TED talk, maybe documentary. You could be brilliant. This one. All right. Is that Kaylee? Yes. All right. Go ahead, Kaylee. Hi. So if I could be brilliant in one uh, area of study or skill, um, I'm a voice performance major, and I find it kind of hard to uh, utilize my ears, which it, which sounds very interesting since I'm a music major, but there's this one class called Aural Skills and you use your ears to dictate um, melodies from what you hear and that can be surprisingly hard when you don't have perfect pitch and I do not and sometimes I even wonder if I even have relative pitch. Um, so because of that it would be so much easier for me I think if I uh, was, I mean, honestly, any level of better at oral skills than I am right now. Um, and I mean, honestly, I think that just comes with practice and I would totally be fine with just practicing and getting better at it, um, which would probably help a lot. Um, this skill can be used, I mean, so many different things. Um, in the real world, when you're not in classes and you're just a musician, and you have your life. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, be part of any creative projects or collaborations, uh, having a good ear and being able to dictate melodies and figure out harmonies just by hearing a chord is so valuable because then um, you can dictate uh, your own sheet music and you don't have to ask or you know find a program that will help you with that which I would imagine is more expensive so being able to do things on your own and just having a more broad uh, area of knowledge is I think very invaluable thank you thank you Kaylee awesome I love that I had uh, my, my roommate freshman year she's also a music major I think comp composition and she would always, like every time after coming back from oral skills it was first like a little bit of a low, depending on how her performance was. <laughs> but then again, that determination you had to go back again, practice, become better at, at her craft. So yeah, um, awesome. It's great. <laughs> All right, we've got our next table topics. If you knew that you were going to inherit a fortune, how would your plans for the future change? Fortune is the sky's the limit with with this amount. Mm -hmm. Let's see. No. I can go again if no one wants to, but only if no one wants to, since I just went. 
Let's see. I think there's a couple of people who haven't quite gone yet, so I'll, I'll, I'll give them a chance. Um, let's see, uh, Logan, would you like to give this question a try? Um, I'm giving it a shot. All right, here's the question again. If you knew that you were going to inherit a fortune, how would your plans for the future change? Um, okay, well, I always wanted to like start my own company and like um, I've always like thought, oh, I don't have enough money to um, be able to start one or I don't have enough experience, but um, I feel like if I knew I was gonna inherit a fortune, maybe I would like uh, be more willing to take a risk. And um, yeah, so um, I'm a computer science major and I, um, I uh, worked over the summer for a company that um, I was like friends with the owner and like he was like telling me how he uh, started like right after college building his own company. And it was, um, it was like really inspirational and like to just like see that for myself is like really exciting. Awesome, thank you, Logan. I love that, you know, having, having an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit, that's, long word um but yeah that's awesome that you have it um i don't know if i could do it personally that's why i'm so in awe of everyone else who can do it and really like the sky's the limit like you can have a lot of interdisciplinary things and subject matters that you learn so definitely like what you decide to pursue in college I mean, that doesn't hold you back from pursuing what dreams you have so awesome thank you logan all right we've got our next table topics about five or six more if you could master one instrument, which would it be? You can either be a musically inclined person or not <laughs> to answer this question. Maybe an instrument you always thought was cool every time you saw it in a band or... I know there's some strange instruments out there, like the theremin. It's like you like control it with your fingers. If you don't know what it is, I'll explain it after the meeting. <laughs> I'll go and take this one. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Uh, if you could master one instrument, which would it be? Uh, I was, when I first heard you say the question, I was trying to remember what the name of the instrument I was thinking was called. And thankfully, you filled in the gap. It's the theremin. I actually first saw the theremin in a video game, which led me to look up some YouTube videos about it. And it is the strangest, eeriest, and somehow coolest instrument. So just the fact that a ton of people don't even know it exists, most likely would be really cool to be able to master it. I'm gonna give a very, most likely poor description from what I understand about it. It somehow, <laughs> It's gonna sound crazy, but you play it by not touching it. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna need your help after the meeting with this one. But essentially, uh, I don't know how its shape looks, but it's, you wave your hands away from it and you're somehow changing the, whatever type of wave it is or frequency and that changes the noise. And it looks so creepy and you can make the creepiest, eeriest noises. Um, for the particular video game I saw, it was like, advertised in the Halloween events that tied in perfectly, but that would be a great instrument to play. And it just looks like magic almost. And that's what's crazy is it's not, it's actually real somehow, even though you're like, oh, I gotta go research some more articles on this and read all these comments in this YouTube video. There's no way this is real, but it is indeed real. So I look forward to hearing Trisha help me out with the description of that and doing your own research on it. Thank you, that'd be my instrument of choice. <laughs> Thank you, Slate. Yeah, it's it's a very cool instrument. It's It has like a bar sticking up and straight edges and like what Slate said, it's like some sort of like wave or frequency. And the closer that you move your fingers and like how you move your fingers, it also changes the tone. So if you think of a synth sound or like 
a light level sounding organ that's kind of similar to what you could expect. Um, but if you haven't heard of it, definitely recommend uh, checking out a quick YouTube video about it because like what Slate said, not not too many people know about it. I know it because I'm I'm into strange music videos, so that's that's how I know. But awesome, awesome response. I think we're on the same wavelength uh, there with that response. All right. I have five more questions prepared, and I think almost everyone has gone here once. So if you'd like to go again, feel free. The question is, which of your personality traits would you like to change? If not personality, maybe physical trait, if you want to go that route. We can make it a little broader. Which of your traits, personally, would you like to change or not change if you want to go that route? Let's see. Noah, I don't think you've gone yet. Would you like to take this one? Sure. Thank you, Trisha. Um, yes. So one trait I was thinking of was on me, like having really good people skills and just wanting to learn about people and what they do and um, how they come about. And I think that's a good thing and the bad thing, um, just because one, you have more connections and you sort of learn how to communicate with people and you sort of learn how to know everyone and just have a really good time. But at the same time, it has its cons of um, a lot of your personal time not necessarily being wasted, but being used up, um, just dealing with an array of different people. And so for me, that's something that I don't want to change, but maybe I want to sharpen up and learn how to control, if that makes sense. So I would say just, um, just my um, people skills and just learning how to control it and not let it um, take up too much of my time to the point whereby I'm hurting myself instead of helping myself, if that makes sense. Thank you so much, Trisha. Thank you, Noah. That's a great, that's a great skill to improve on. I think the more that some, anyone is able to connect with the person, you know, find that common ground and establish that rapport, the more you can have a lasting relationship with that person, whether it's through a project or a personal relationship. So awesome response, Noah. All right, we've got four left. Or left our question is do you okay do you possess any of the qualities of your astrological sign this might be for the question for people more into it i don't know why your astrological sign if no one here knows their sign we, we can skip it i can draw a new card as well Anyone, well, I guess first question, does anyone know their astrological sign? Just give me a, like a yes or a no as so I can see Gage. Oh, Courtney, I, oh, it's late. <laughs> Kaylee, maybe, <laughs> Preciosa. <laughs> oh, Zorin as well. Any of y'all want to take this question? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> I'm gonna give it. A, is that super sign? All right, I'm gonna give it five, four. We'll go ahead and take. It. So right. I did definitely just look up a quick trait of Sagittarius, which I believe is my sign, as my birthday is December 9th. and one I saw was optimistic. I think that one is very true to me. I'll start off with that astrology. I believe is very. It's fun to just look at all the traits and everything, but you shouldn't ever take it too seriously and get wrapped up in it. But with that said, being optimistic, I think that's very true to me. I think anything I do, I try to be optimistic. And I think almost a synonym with it is confidence. You want to be go right into whatever you're doing, which must as much confidence and optimism as you can. Otherwise, you're going to doom yourself for failure. If you go into a test, a speech, any sort of event, not being optimistic, being pessimistic, you're going to set yourself up for failure. So why would you do that to yourself? So that's why I'm glad that that's a trait that I do hold. 
Now, too much optimism or confidence can be a bad thing if you don't back it up with actual practice or skill. So it's important to keep yourself in check. But I am glad that I have that skill and I hope you guys look into your signs if you ever get a table topic like this in the future. Thanks, Trisha. <laughs> Thanks, Slate, for, for answering. Yes, uh, if you needed to you know, do a quick search, that, that was okay, since personally I didn't know, but be sure to pay attention to the rest of the meeting. <laughs> All right, we've got three more. Uh, I'll just go in order here. Who taught you how to ride a bike? Or if you don't know how to ride a bike, Maybe who taught you how to X, Y, and Z skill? You fill in your choice. Oops. Noah? Yeah. Yes. Who taught you how to ride a bike slash X, Y, and Z fill in your choice of skill? So for some reason, all of the little skills that I've learned like as a child, it's always been another person that was my age that taught me how to do these things. It's, it's never been an adult for some reason. So, um, for instance, who taught me how to ride a bike? I think it was somebody in my neighborhood, like a childhood friend. I don't remember who, but it was definitely a childhood friend. And I definitely ended up with a scar on both of my knees um, and on the elbow. I mean, if you have the signature elbow scar, I can relate. <laughs> um, so, a childhood friend taught me how to ride a bike. You know, I always wonder if kids nowadays have those signature scars since phones are out and since kids nowadays don't go out of their homes. Cause like I've noticed that a lot of a lot of kids growing up now don't have those signature scars on their elbows and knees like they should. <laughs> and so, so so if you guys can relate, I can relate. But yeah, so um I wanted to talk about who taught me how to tie my shoe. That was my sister. Um that's ten months apart from me, so it's always been another kid or another another someone. It's never been an adult because I feel like it would just be weird for some reason. I don't know. But thank you. Thank you, Noah. Yeah. You know, signature scars, that's like part of growing up, pretty much like a rite of passage for, for anyone growing up, you know? Um, but yeah, I, that, that, that's an interesting take. That's like how you know, like who knows, just trying to, <laughs> trying to look for those tell, tell points on people. <laughs> All right, we've got two left. And this next question, which historical time period would you like to most visit? Oh. All right, go ahead, Scott. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Uh, oh, okay, guys. Well, I hope you don't mind if I'm taking all the questions on history. All right, well, uh, one, uh, right. One time period. One time period that I would um, I would well want to visit the most. It would it would it would do, would would definitely have would definitely have to be the um, what, what was it? Uh, uh, yes, it, it would it be the uh, what's called the um, Edwardian Edwardian era, uh, which is that period period of of English um, English history from from nineteen oh one up into up until nineteen nineteen ten. The, re uh, the reign of who was then the king of England, Edward the Seventh, and the reason why I'd uh, like to visit that time period, it'd be interesting to see everything that was going on at that time. I mean, to be to be in, in London of all places at the at the very height of the British Empire, an empire that ruled almost a uh, almost a qu quarter of the world, and you and you're in this ca ca you're in this capital of London where you see the pu uh, the pomp, the pageantry. Of a um, of a confident empire, but yet at the same time, you also see, see the rise of what we take for granted nowadays. But we, sit, uh, but we're ju just new uh, new political uh, parties coming on the coming on the scene uh, during the Edwardian era. Era, I should say, like the uh, the Labour Party, for instance, the current UK la Labour Party. It would not have uh, accelerated as much had it not been for. The, uh, the rise in, in socialism, which ha happens in the Edwardian era. So, so just being able to see a, a period of significant change, even though it could be a very dangerous change, I'd like to see how people live through that in the Edwardian era. So thanks, guys. Thanks, Scott. Personally, I have no qualms with you taking the history questions just because I myself, I'm not the most like 
I wouldn't say I'm not interested. I think it's interesting when you learn history outside of the classroom. So that's why I love going to museums or just hearing people talk about it. So um, awesome response, you know, learn something new every day. All right, we've got our potentially last one. I mean, I've got a, a whole stack of cards. Like I said, we could keep doing this all day. Um, but for now, we've got this last question. What fashion trend you followed was very cool then, but now looks ridiculous? I'll take this one. Go ahead, Preciosa. So growing up, I was very much a girly girl and I love to play with Barbie dolls and Disney princess dolls. And this is a now discontinued line, but if y'all are familiar with the Bratz fashion dolls, I used to love playing with Bratz so much. And they would always wear these super trendy um, fashion accessories and clothing from the 2000s. And here I am talking about the era in which Paris Hilton reigned supreme on all the tabloids and the newspapers. Now, I thought Paris Hilton growing up was one of the most iconic fashion moguls ever known. However, not even Paris Hilton could save the brand baby fat spelled exactly b-a-b-y space f-p-h-a-t baby fat now i begged my mother to go to the nearest burlington coat factory when i was a kid and it was there that she bought me my very own little pink kid size baby fat purse. And it was so bedazzled. It was so like over the top blingalicious. And I thought it was perfect for me because I was so girly. I mean, I am like very girly now, but I wouldn't be caught dead with a tiny little baby fat purse um, in the year of our Lord, 2020. And that is simply because of how over the top glamorous it was. I mean, I could rock a little tiny baby fat purse now, and it is about the size of this case of index cards that I'm holding but it won't hold my phone and my wallet and my keys because it is meant to be very tiny. And so baby fat purses, I don't think should come back. <laughs> Thank you for, for that awesome response. I've never, I don't think I've ever encountered a baby fat purse in my life, but you know, based on that description, I can literally picture it in, in my head and just visualize uh, that, that first. So thank you for that response. All right, I think that just about wraps this up for Table Topics. So thank you everyone for, for volunteering. Um, I will first call on our timer, Kaylee, where are all our speakers in time? Um, so most everybody was on time except for our last speaker, but only by a little bit. So I think it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All good. All right. Uh, with that, I have just put in everyone's names and what their table topics question was. If you could go ahead and send your votes to Noah Karanga. Uh, make sure to vote for your first choice and for your second choice because it does come into play with votes. So if you aren't familiar, um, anyone who gets voted first gets two points, anyone who voted second gets one point. And I've been in the same position that Noah has been now in telling and it's fun just seeing like the, the votes go in and out as they come in. Um, so if you do vote for yourself, definitely vote for first and second, but regardless, you should do that anyway as it's good practice. At the same time, while you're sending those votes into Noah Karanga, the same method that 
you go to like the Zoom chat too, and then default is everyone, just change it to Noah's name. If you could also send me some feedback as the Table Topics Master for today, I'd very much greatly appreciate it. With that, I will now bring back to the stage our Toastmaster Slate Nations. Thank you, Trisha. I think that was a great Table Topics section. I'm gonna go give another just quick 10 seconds to finish up votes and uh, feedback, Patricia. I have one question. Um, yeah. Should I like paste like the uh, the times for everybody? I can do that like in a big chunk block instead of like all spaced out like I did before. Um, what do you mean by pacing? Excellent. So like at the end of everyone's uh, little speech, I did put down their full time, mm -hmm. but I can do like everyone with their name, just like not after their, I'm sorry, I'm not explaining this well. <laughs> you got it, I got you. Um... I think it's fine because we, we uh, I, I just called on you to to like say it all the times. But if you want to, you know, you can. You know, personal choice. Each person kind of brings their own flair to the to the, the reporter roles, which I love. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I think if you're talking about for the rest of this meeting, I think how you're doing it's fine. Um, yeah, sorry I didn't follow so well. Um, that's all good. Moving on to our third and final section. It is our evaluation section. This will be led by Noah today, who is our general evaluator, and he'll explain what he does and how his section will look like. Noah, you can take the stage. Uh, 